Welcome back, everyone, to uh, Exchange Live. My name is Paul Hill, and I'm delighted again to be able to speak to uh, accomplished investor Roland Head of um, the Dividend Note and Stockopedia. So, welcome, Roland. Hi, uh, uh, morning, Paul. It's uh, thanks for having me again. It's good to good to be back with you. Well, I'm absolutely delighted to have you here. Um, now uh, we've got lots of um, big um, uh, corporate news kicking off over the next few weeks, not least the US uh, uh, quarter one earnings season. Um, but before we sort of like get your view about the markets in general going forward, can you just remind investors of what type of stocks you uh, you like? Yeah, so the the majority of my, my my portfolio is really what I like to what I hope what I like to call or what I hope are kind of quality income investments that I can hold for a long time and that will be able to deliver sustainable income growth, you know, over over long periods. Uh, and that's that's sort of about three quarters of where my uh, investments are and then as well as that i do have a smaller section of the portfolio that's really shorter term kind of value momentum type situations that uh, it's a portfolio that i've write about at stockopedia as well over the years and and so that's like a, a side project and uh, i think what's been interesting so far this year is that actually the shorter term stuff has done better um so far in aggregate than than the the longer term positions but i'm um, Hoping, hoping that will even out over time. Yeah, well, I quite like those uh, the sound of those spicy <laughs> shares that uh, we'll perhaps talk about a few of them. But uh, in terms of your, your portfolio in Q1, how has it performed? I mean, mine, unfortunately, is that, mine's been pretty soggy, has it? But how's your, how have you got on? Yeah, as I was saying, my, so the, um, yeah, my kind of uh, value momentum type stocks at, uh, in, that, in that portfolio, they, they were a little bit ahead of the market. Uh, over the first quarter, but my income portfolio didn't really do as quite as well. There were one or two problems, and and probably Close Brothers was the one that really uh, did the damage. And so that that was pretty just just below uh, just below the market over the the first quarter. So yeah, not a bit of a mixed start to the year mm. really, but uh, still I think there's um, mostly a, a fairly positive outlook. And a lot for a lot of companies, evaluations are still attractive. So I mean, I don't think there's any reason to uh, to stay away from UK equities, except perhaps that everybody else is as well. Um, <laughs> well, we did but, see yeah. actually, did see in the uh, fund flows for small caps actually. We've had 34 months consistently of outflows of um, public um, UK equities, but in March, for the first time in the small cap sector. There was an uptick. Now, again, there's swallows and summers and stuff like that, but that's got to be positive, I would have thought. I don't know about yeah. you. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I saw that this week. There were quite a few asset managers that have issued updates, several this week, and I think it was Polar Capital. They reported in some inflows, and I'd, I would like to think, and it seems logical to think that this, you know, that the outflows must be must be slowing down, especially because we're starting to see positive movements across the market in a lot of sectors. And so you get that situation where possibly people pulled their money out from the funds when they were falling. And now they're maybe hopefully or you know potentially in danger of missing the the gains as the market starts to recover. Um, you, you tend to see this, don't you, with fund flows that people pull out when things are going down, but then they miss the start of the recovery quite often. And uh, a, lot, a lot of the asset managers are reporting positive investment performance but they're still seeing outflows so whether that's a sign of a turning point uh, i don't know as you say it's yeah. uh, swallows and summers it's a bit early to be sure but you can see you can make a case for that i think yeah well it isn't going to take many much inflows to really move the dial in the small caps because liquidity is really um, uh, small so uh, that really push it up now just on that dividend play i mean one thing i know when we chatted the first time you didn't mention any banks and the banks are starting to report out in the states uh, this week in fact today actually i think we've got citibank and goldman's and jp morgan but they're the us ones well, just in terms of the dividends, I mean, obviously the banks have been in the UK notorious for paying dividends. You have Lloyd's at about 5%. I think NatWest is at just under 5%. HSBC is at about 7% dividend yield. I think Barclays is about 4 4 and a half, something like that. But it's, it's they're chunky deals in chunky yields. Is it, are banks of interest to you? Or are you just, you're just an, an area that you're just very, very black box sort of wary of? <laughs> Yeah, there is that black spot, black box thing, I think, with banks. But what's put me off more, I think, I mean, 
you know, it's, I think it's generally accepted they're in much better health than they used to be. Certainly, it's not like it was before the financial crisis. But a lot of them, for so long, they've struggled to generate attractive return on equity. You know, they've just been not very profitable. And whether that's a factor of the UK economy, the regulation, I don't, you know, I think there's a combination of things. Um, but that's more what's put me off. I don't think there's any great risk with the big banks yeah. anymore um of the kind of you know the kind of thing that people were worried about after 2008 but i don't know uh, i don't know kind of where they're going where they have if they they don't always seem to have much scope for growth and they haven't really been able to demonstrate um kind of above average profitability and i think that's why so for so long a lot of them have traded below book value as well it's been a yeah. a bit of a value trap situation so i don't have any of the big bank shares but in terms of just income I, I don't see i don't see uh that there's too much to worry about yeah um from what's on offer okay good well just remind everybody who wants to put some questions in the uh in the box just uh just drop them in that well i'll ask um, um roland and um oh crikey we've got we've got lots coming in at the moment um First of all, a, a good morning. Any thoughts from Roland on right move or money supermarket? I don't know about do, do, do you want to start any one of those at all? I mean, right moves obviously the the property portal in the UK, dominant market position, sort of like uh, seventy percent operating margins, and then you have got money supermarket, which is obviously the price comparison website that um, is coming back. I think it got hit during the pandemic because it used to sell energy packages on com competition, but has come back roaring in terms of tourist um insurance and i think holiday insurance and um things like housing and uh, and financial products yeah no i mean right move is one of those businesses it's the uh, wonderfully profitable and, and generates a lot of cash it's always been uh it's a bit of a low yield uh although the dividend history is very strong it's it's always been mm. such a low yield it's probably not something i'd buy for income but you can't kind of help but admire the business i think and you know the only real risk is maybe that eventually some kind of more credible competition will will emerge um that hasn't you know hasn't happened yet but with such a profitable business there's a lot of incentive i suppose for someone to try and break into it but yeah. uh yeah i mean money supermarket is probably is is one i like a lot more and as you say a few years ago it was struggling with growth and the pandemic but uh, and it looked like they were starting to try and acquire growth i suppose and i thought maybe the situation you know maybe it had reached a scale that it couldn't it, it couldn't deliver the sort of growth it had in the past but mm. actually money supermarket seems to be doing quite well again really now from what i've seen and uh Again, it has a lot, a lot of attractive characteristics in terms of profitability, cash generation, and the yield is is well over five percent. Uh, I think, yeah, I mean, I quite like money supermarket uh, at the moment. Um, the utility business has never really come back, and whether it will or not, I don't mm. know. I think it might be a bit different to the past because there's been such a shakeout in the market. So many of those cheap, low cost suppliers have gone that uh, I suspect that the utility switching won't be quite as an attractive thing to be involved in as, as it was before. But certainly there's lots of potential with all the financial products. And I think for a long time now, they've been working on something with mortgages, which maybe one day could be valuable. Yeah. So yeah, I quite like money supermarket. Um, yeah. Right move. It, it is kind of, it is what it is. I don't know really. I don't, I find it hard to, to have any insight, I suppose, in what's likely to happen to right move, except that if the property market picks up, I suppose they, they will do, do a bit better again. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, right move is obviously a, uh, a titan in its industry. It's got such a strong networking effect that it's going to be, uh, it's, it's a bit like a quasi bond, even though it doesn't play a yield in terms of, but it's adding new services. And I think with, mm -hmm. with money supermarket one, it's another trophy asset. And I would not be surprised actually, if some of the private equity guys look at that business and uh, put the serious sort of like, you know, lens on it because it generates a lot of cash um, and therefore, and it's not particularly expensive. So you, you leverage it up, particularly if interest rates come down, then it'll just generate, generate a pretty mm. good um, pretty good return okay well let's switch sectors i know one company you quite like is hunting which does, does basically i think sort of pipes and tubes into the oil and gas sector for sort of like transferring oil and gas i'm guessing uh, and and also a lot of subsea mar uh, marine uh, types of oil and gas services what sort of attracts you to this one it, it sort of trades on roughly around about um 
what, 11 and a half mm. times PE pays a 2.2% yield. Yeah, I think this is another one. It's a situation where there's, there's really good momentum and and uh, the growth prospects seem to be pretty strong at the moment. And mm. uh, I mean, one of the areas where it's, it's heavily involved is is onshore drilling in the US. So that's yeah. the shale market and so on. And uh, as well as as well as the offshore stuff uh, that you mentioned, um, it. Uh, let me just hunting, what hunting do they, they they make the equipment but they sell it and they also rent it so one thing about this business is it really has a lot of exposure to industry spending cycles and some of it is quite short cycles so you know the visibility isn't always there i think far yeah. into the future but it's really doing well at the moment and um the pipeline you know the recent results uh recent results showed revenue was up 28 percent last year and and their non-oil and gas revenue is also growing fast. It's up to about 8% of the group revenue so far. And they're, they're hoping to make that more of a meaningful thing over yeah. the next five years or so. So, you know, profits, it's a situation where I think at the moment the, uh, the business is benefiting from, benefiting from operating leverage and, uh, you know, a strong order book. And as far as I can see, I think there could be a bit further to go with this. Um it's probably not something I'd hold kind of permanently because of the, it does have some pretty brutal ups and downs, but the balance sheet is okay. It's actually still only trading in line with uh, kind of just below book value, I think. So is it, can you see just to make, just to do a check, can you see the chart there, uh, Roland? Is that, is that the correct chart on just to make sure I've got the right one? Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's the, that's the, hunting that's the one. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay, yeah. good. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure because I've, I've been struggling with technology. Okay, sorry yeah, about so that. Yeah, so I mean, you can see on the chart that uh, when the pandemic uh, hit and the oil market was, you know, maybe it was already slowing down, maybe mm. um, it was pretty brutal for hunting, but they have, um, you know, it's, uh, they're not in a situation, they've, the balance sheet has basically been strong enough that they've been able to to get through this, to invest and control costs and do what they've needed to do to, to, to deliver a kind of healthy recovery without without needing to dilute shareholders. So uh, compared to say, well, Petrofag, for instance, which is in a bad way at the moment, mm. hunting has, has come out of this well and still seems to have a lot of momentum, you know, double digit earnings growth over the next couple of years is 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 in the forecast so uh, yeah i think it's a nice kind of uh, growth at, growth at a reasonable price maybe at the moment yeah i did actually see their last statement i think the management team have got some really ambitious growth objectives haven't they over the next uh, three or four years and they're going to really sort of push that uh, the eps up so um yeah i think with you even though it only trades at about 11 and a half times if you looked at the the peg ratio it's significantly um less than uh, zero less than one i would have thought yeah i think it's um about about 0.4 looking uh, yeah looking <laughs> Just... here so according to on, on stockopedia anyway it's about that so yeah i mean if the for, if the forecasts come in it's it's going to deliver a lot of a lot of extra profit over the next couple of years and i don't think it's too expensive at the moment yeah okay one well, which is um it, it's again a big dividend payer that people should have a look at but is the is resources play is uh, rio tinto now it, it's obviously got a big exposure to iron ore and therefore by by default china and uh, its recovery and it's been struggling a bit in terms of you know obviously the property there but the but the price now has started to sort of come back let me put the chart back on and it pays a really rich yield obviously let me um yeah, they do have a real history of of uh, of of dividends for such a cyclical business. They yes. they have always had a good commitment to the dividend, and mm. certainly anyone who's owned them over the last uh, few years has, has had a lot of a lot of cash out of the business. Yeah, um, I mean, basically, I mean, the, the the sort of the the thesis here is if you want a solid, dependable exposure to commodities, particularly iron ore and copper, which is used increasingly, and obviously, in electrification. But if you believe and have the view such that the world needs to spend more on infrastructure and China is not dead and buried for the rest of its life, because obviously the housing sector has really, really struggled, but we're at the worst of the cycle there, then you've got to look at people like you know BHP and Rio and say, well, actually, this is a pretty good sleep at night type of stock because um, you, know, you can basically clip a 6% dividend yield. And if you get 3 or 4%, sort of like, you know, commodity price inflation, you, you, on top of that, you'll be getting a double digit return for, for a long, long, long period. So mm. it seems like a a fairly low risk type business. Unexciting, I agree, because if you look at the chart, it hasn't gone anywhere for five years. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think, um, yeah, well, I mean, one of the things that always strikes me about this, I think is, is worth remembering, it is really, iron ore is still really almost all of the business in terms yes, of profit. Is. I think the last couple of years, for instance, it's been 80 to 90% of earnings, and that's that's not, that's fairly typical from what I can see. So mm. for a long time now, the, the copper business, it's been talked about as a, a, a source of future growth, but it doesn't, it, and I think that is starting to come through. But it hasn't yet made a huge contribution to profits, and mm. uh, and the iron ore business, the Pilbara the giant mines in the Pilbara in, in Western Australia, they're still they're just an absolute cash cow. they you know although costs have gone up a bit, they're so profitable and far more yeah. profitable than the remainder of the business. So it's I think you do have to have a little bit of a, of awareness of or, you know of a view on commodity prices. I like Rio, like you say, I like it. I think it's a fairly safe business. To me, it looks more like the price is up with events at the moment rather than cheap. But if you, as you say, if there's a bit of an uptick in demand for infrastructure and so on, and, and China maybe isn't as bad as people have suggested, then it could could still do okay. Um, it's one of those stocks I'd like to buy when things are bad for you know for miners, as mm. as happens periodically. I'm not sure if that's true at the moment, but yeah, a decent a decent st- a business, I think. Interesting. Why did you say it's expensive? It trades at about eight and a half times PE. Is that because it's sort of – and iron ore prices have come down because of China as well. So it doesn't yeah. smell as though it's overvalued. But No, I mean, perhaps not. I'm mean, looking at it in terms of the kind of CAPE PE ratio. So, you know, a 10-year PE ratio, that's about – from what I can see, that's about 10 times as well. And, you know, it's trading at two times book value. So – well, I know. I think I know it's about hundred dollars or something at the moment. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, hey, you're a good so, yeah, man I mean, there. Well, that's that isn't <laughs> just, a bad. You know, that's you didn't, you didn't have to think about that, did you? <laughs> <laughs> it's Very yeah. Impressive. I mean, it's it's down from like those two hundred dollar level we saw a few years ago. But in a historical context, I think it's kind of somewhere in the middle. You know, I I don't know. Trying to predict yeah. commodity prices is is impossible, or at least it's way beyond my pay grade. But. Yeah. My feeling is it's not a depressed valuation at the moment, I suppose. I'd, I'd put it that way. Yeah, okay. All right. We've got um, another question talk, um, from uh, George Roach asking about um, RWS, which is the language translation business that um, is very, very cheap. And I'm not sure what it is, but I think it's on about less than 10 times PE, pays a good yield, about 4 or 5%, and um, also, um, he's doing a stock buyback. I don't know if you have any thoughts on this one at all. Because, let me put the chart up. But uh, yeah, it's gone I mean, nowhere. I mean, yeah. It's, yeah, this is actually one I hold. Um, oh, does I it? Oh, say. okay. Uh, well, that's why somebody's asked it. Yeah, okay. and it's it's on a, yeah, on a PE of about eight. And the as you say, there's a, the dividend here. I think it's a bit higher, actually. I think it's about 6%. Yeah. And uh, long history of, of not being cut and, and steady growth. It's Yeah, it's so they're all about sort of long content, localization translation and 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 increasingly i think really it's becoming a software business but they are exposed to sort of uh, can the consumer demand so where spending by big consumer companies and tech companies has eased off i think that's had some impact on them in terms of their external uh, customer demand although they do historically they did specialist stuff like patent translation they they that's only a, that's kind of what a niche that's still a still a valuable part of the business but this consumer content management kind of solution has become a a bigger part of the business in recent years and also been expanded through a lot of acquisitions and i think where they are at the moment is growth is weakened there's been a bit of a thought that maybe ai is going to mean that the services they offer aren't as valuable as they were and on top of that, I think the company itself has got to do some investment in IT to really bring all its systems that it's acquired together. They talk about having duplicate systems and they admit they've got some technical debt, which is kind of historic underinvestment in IT. So it's in a bit of a transition phase, I think. But to me, I, th- I think they kind of on an enterprise level, the services they provide are going to remain valuable because it's much more than just translating. It's either regulated service stuff, you know, uh, services for regulated clients, but also a much broader range of managing uh, companies' content across different countries, different languages, and all the rest of it full. So to me, I think it's cheap, and I think it's it's a good business, but it's certainly not, maybe uh not at its best at the moment, and that's whether that's the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I think yeah, it could I'm, well, I quite it, like it. Yeah, it could well get taken out. There's no doubt about it. I would say though, when it comes to AI, and this is the the big fear, I guess, is that in the sort of the the, the more commoditized part of their translation services, so not the patent translations, not the regulated stuff for financial services and engineering firms for sell, you know, health and safety and all this sort of stuff, but the more you know sort of website mm. type standard translations it's that it's that margin area that people are worried about because you just i mean I'm, i use language translation software myself and actually it's flipping great it really is superb and you do wonder whether it's that that what the, as you rightly point out the transition it's it's moving f- more and quickly upstream mm. to stuff that can't be disimmediated by generative ai language translation yeah i mean i think the point there and the point the company makes certainly is that they have their own machine translation they've been using it for a long time and i think something like 60 percent of their words from Mm. memory they say already go through a machine translation process so their software tools are something they sell and i can only see that uh, you know they they already do a lot of the translation like that and they sell these products to to other people to corporate clients and even to translators i think um so they're already deeply involved in in that and i think it's trying to prove that they can add a layer of value on top of that for for enterprise scale clients Mm. that uh, in terms of really managing the whole content solution that is maybe the value there but i agree that that sort of basic translation is going to be more and more automated it it really can't be any other way i suppose yeah i think it isn't so much that that will go away it's just is pricing because if let's just say for argument's sake microsoft decided to offer a you know, then their nuanced software for free. Mm. And uh, it, it obviously scuppers a lot of that commodity. Okay, well, let's let's shift gears again. Another one which came out with um, a trading update year end is Speedy Hire, which is a plant hire company um, in the UK, it does sort of tools and stuff like this to largely to contractors DIY, but also to a few households, etc. Gone through a bit of a soft patch. The shares have sold off very badly. Um, it's got a just as in terms of its its valuation, shares traded about twenty five p at the moment. I think its net tangible book is around thirty four p. So the trading trading below book, and um, it got hit over the winter because it was a bit warmer than anybody expected, and they normally hire out heaters, I think, as well. Um, I don't know whether you've had a look at this one at all because um, it clearly is uh, it, it's very very cheap. But is it a value play or a value trap? To me, it looks as though, you know, it basically you could argue it either way. But what's your mm. thought? Yeah, I think I think that's a fair comment. It's um, it does look cheap, and and uh, you could certainly say there's a bit of a cyclical opportunity here, a bit of an uptick in spending, and and they could do well. Uh, I suppose I could see it could be, and so I could see it, it could be a nice trade. But um, for me, it doesn't. The company itself doesn't have a brilliant record. Um, of kind of management and and mm. maybe of reporting too. I'm, you know, the uh, was it last year or the year before they they admitted that they'd lost about twenty million pounds worth of scaffolding because they hadn't kept track of it properly. Uh, I know that they say Whoops. that's all been fixed now and they've got better asset management in place, but it doesn't. To me, I don't know if it's a, just the best quality business in this sector. It does look really cheap, and the balance sheet uh, seems fine. Um, and there's actually quite a big dividend there too, I think, at the moment. Yeah, something 6% like, uh, plus. Yeah, but uh, it's just, yeah, I mean, if I was investing in this sector, I think we talked about last time, uh, the VP uh, specialist yeah. business there, I'd, I'd rather buy something with a bit of a better track record of, of quality and, uh, and good management. But yeah, I mean, the only other thing actually that struck me about Speedy Hire's update this week is when you read it, it seemed a bit vague and maybe just a bit downbeat. But uh, from what I see, the broker forecasts have actually really been cut for both this year and next year on the back of that update. So whether it was a bit of a crafty profit warning, possibly, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure. But yeah, I think I, that, I, I take that as quite a good sign and, and really dovetails to what you said earlier on. I, it came out with some pretty soft numbers, bet lower than expectations. And going forward, the broker took a real knife to actually expectations. 
But actually, the shares, yes, went down about, I don't know, 2 or 3% immediately, but actually came back and were solid in, in, in a market that is brutal, has been brutal. You'd expected a bigger reaction. So I take that actually as quite a good sort of like indicator that maybe we have reached a point. I mean, when you get a stock, mm. that, I mean, let's be clear about it. Speedy High has been around for years. Oh, yeah. Um, and if it can be turned around, it'd be, you know, decent. But when you get a stock with its dividend yield above its PE ratio, then you've got to sort of say, well, okay, that is pretty cheap. And it does seem to have a decent balance sheet. I would also say, and this falls into the, the positives for VP, as we've talked about before, is that if you're a national player, you've got the scale, you've got the balance sheet and the money, then to um, to electrify and to ups, uh, upgrade your fleet, whereas the a lot of sort of like mom and pop um, plant tire operators, which is the vast majority of the industry because it's very fragmented, won't be able to do that. And as obviously, you know, moving towards you know lower emissions is something that mm. most most customers actually want and not only for improving their esg footprints but increasingly also i don't know if you something i've noticed quite a lot how many companies are putting solar solar farms on their on their roofs it's massive and therefore if you have an electrified you know um uh, plant tire then actually your customers going it's going to be saving your customers a shed load of money because they can just juice up those that equipment just overnight well not overnight with it solar mm. but you know during the day yeah. <laughs> so you know yeah, you, no. look at, you look at it and actually uh, they could the, the bigger players could grow faster uh, significantly than the smaller ones because they they've got the financial muscle to be able to upgrade their fleet yeah i think you're right um in terms of electrification and also just technically in terms of momentum, there's, there's, as you say, the shares didn't really move much, and and it it is definitely it double, as far as we can tell, it is definitely cheap at the moment on most measures. So yeah, I think yeah, I can see the attraction here. It's um, maybe not for me personally, but I would I can see that there's it's worth looking at potentially. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's uh, again switch gears to another one. Automotive. We've got uh, uh, TI Fluid Systems, which is another one which has been you know pretty much battered share, and it's a sort of like. It's, it's classed as an old traditional um, sort of like uh, fuel pipeline, fuel tank and brake line sort of like manufacturer, world class manufacturer uh, of for, for cars and passenger vehicles and stuff like this. And obviously, a lot of investors have been spooked by the transition to electrification, thinking that actually, mm. you know, there's there's no going to be not going to be yeah. nil, not no nil for fuel tanks and for fuel pipes and all this sort of stuff, um, but actually a lot of a lot of vehicles now electrification are going to be hybrid. So do you take do you want to take us through this one and what sort of a what you quite like about it? I mean, obviously the valuation is very attractive. Yeah, I mean it's actually quite a new one for me. I it's a, so it is a FTSE 250 business and it floated I think at um, the back end of 2017 possibly and uh, it. Uh, the shares really crashed kind of 2021, 22. And as you say, that was when the the the, the kind of excitement built up about electric yeah. vehicles. And um, I think possibly there were some other factors as well in the business, maybe that, 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 that you know, caused, caused it some problems for a while. But it seems to be trading a lot better now um, under a new chief executive and, and uh, really with you know performance is really improving debt has come down a bit i think yeah and uh as you say there's the the the, the business is just over i think just over half of it um is in car fuel systems and obviously that is something that you kind of we have to assume is not going to be a structural growth market going forwards and maybe could be in decline but there's going to be other cooling systems and fluid systems in electric vehicles and i think that ti fluids now really putting some effort into trying to uh expand that side of its business and 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 hopefully and innovate some more so you know as you say look it's on about six times forward earnings the yield is now up to uh, i think about four and a half percent forecast for this year and um my feeling is now it's been through a difficult patch but uh, if it can continue to turn around you know to continue turning around itself the way it has been i think it could be cheap and could be quite a nice business um a nice sort of british industrial business with a good market share and a good good kind of pedigree to to look at so as i say it's something i've only started looking at recently but i it does seem um potentially interesting uh, and profitability is now really recovering nicely too so that should support uh you know cash generation and and bringing that debt down which does look slightly higher maybe than mm. than i'd like it to be 
Yeah, I would say, you know, looking at, the, I mean, I'm not an expert on charts, but that says to me that it, it was, it's been sold off, you know, too much. And with a, what, nearly 5% or 4.5% dividend yield trading at six and a half times PE, it just looks wrongly priced for a business that isn't, it doesn't seem to be in terminal decline to me. It's got sort of opportunities and, uh, you know, structural um, structural opportunities. Okay, well, let's move to another one. We've got this pay point, which has been sort of like uh, in structural decline, but now has seemed to be transitioning upstream. It basically it started its life, I think, doing those ATMs in shops that allowed people to uh, pay for their BBC license fees and to yeah, and utility bills were a big thing. Yeah, bills, paying yeah. utility bills in cash. Yeah, yeah but but it's actually branched out in that it bought. Uh, a Christmas hamper uh, business and is also doing other payments and also I think deliveries as well, sort of like um, not actually physically delivering, but for the e-commerce handling the sort of like the drop off points and the, um, you know, for both of the Yeah, the Collect Plus uh, yeah. things where you have shops where you can use Collect Plus to drop off parcels and so on. That's part of PayPoint. Yeah. Yeah. Do you um, want to take us through this one? Because again, it's very, very cheap, isn't it? But it's the business seems to be doing pretty well. Yeah, it does, and it's it's one of those things that's been over the it's been there's been a lot of change, a lot of moving parts. I think the last five years or so, they've they've made some acquisitions. Then they've been, I think, trying to change the emphasis of the business to get away from the the decline in in cash activity. And now it seems to be that they provide this full this kind of electronic point of sale solution, really, for convenience mm -hmm. stores. They do a lot of things with card payments. They've bought a, some kind of card payment network that services is SMEs. Um, they, as you say, they acquired the love to shop and the, is it appreciate the appreciate business? That's it, I appreciate think they acquired. Yeah, yeah, that was part Christmas savings and love to shop, I think. Mm. And so they've got all of this stuff, which I suppose is, um, and I think they have, they've had kind of government contracts during the pandemic and things like that to deliver benefits and vouchers to people, you know, um, to deliver them in cash and so on. So there's been, there's, what I found is looking at it over the last few years, there's been a lot of moving parts. And sometimes you think, is it the acquisitions and all the activity that appears to be generating growth? Or is the, is the underlying business really growing? But it's looking more and more to me like the business is performing well. Then uh, it's, you know, consolidating nicely. And as you say, it's it's always been very profitable, very cash generative. And even now, the operating margin is about 20%, you know, 30% yeah. return on equity last year really puts out a lot of cash as um and there's an eight percent yield so i think it is starting to look like it's come through the period maybe a difficult period and is probably cheap that's that's my feeling i suppose that's 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 how i've been looking at it on balance mm. and is the is that eight percent yield sustainable i mean it's about a 40p isn't it or something a dividend in, in pence i mean yeah that's right yeah i think last year the payout was uh about 36 37p and it's um they i think they make four payments a year uh rather than two but uh, i mean it's covered by it seems to be covered by earnings and uh and historically covered by cash generation it's it seems to be sustainable if you know if the current if the current if things keep moving in the current uh on the current traje trajectory mm. if you okay. it's Okay, good. Yes. Okay, well, let's. Um, there's a couple of questions which came in um, overnight. Is Mears is one, which is the um, contractor or servicer of affordable homes in the UK. It's by far and away the largest. I think it had full year results um, yesterday. Got a good, strong cash balance, um, and and the results looked excellent. But I think they put a fairly muted um, outlook for um, uh, for this year, largely on the back of management contracts which are reducing and i, I i'm not going to know the details of it specifically but i i guess what that means is that not only do they service and repair and do all the in, you know improvement for affordable homes for for housing associations but also they have management contracts for those and i guess we'll get, i guess the housing association says actually you shouldn't re, you shouldn't be managing it and, and doing all the repairs and billing it because you're the person who approves the invoices then in the buyer in fact mm. but uh, i don't know if you ever had a look at this one because again it trades at uh, uh, well i'm not sure exactly what it trades but i think the last time i looked it was about 12 times or something paying a decent yield yeah, I think so. It's um, yeah, one of those businesses, those outsourcing type businesses that went through a bad patch a few years ago, but it seems to have come back quite well. And and as yeah. you say, really been trading well the last couple of years and and had some good momentum. 
it's um yeah i know i i doesn't seem to be it doesn't seem to be anything obviously obvious to worry about at the moment it's probably not uh wouldn't be at the top of my list but uh yeah i mean the recent the results look fine and there's there's cash on the balance sheet um it could be it could be one that has further to go although you wonder though as you what you say about management contracts you wonder where the margin is and whether that could maybe have an impact on margins even if it doesn't affect the top yeah. line so much uh, i don't know the business well enough to yeah to say, I, would, but... I, would, I was just looking at the margins actually they're just less than five percent i would say actually if you're a a decent you know servicer you could probably particularly with national scale you may be scoped to push that up albeit you know there aren't there's are there is budgetary constraints and all that affordable housing sector so there will be pricing pressure from the from the government or quasi government but um it looks like a well, I mean, the chart has done very well indeed, hasn't mm. it? The shares have done extremely well. I guess, I guess the below, you know, when it hit, when it hit in the pandemic in 2020, everybody was saying, "Well, crikey, you know, it's never going to be able to get into service these, you know, people's homes because it's not allowed to." And that was the time to buy, wasn't it? There is a there is a time and a price for everything, I guess. Yeah, it was a terrific. It was a <laughs> certainly yeah. Until 2022, really, you could have uh, yeah, you could have doubled your money. Uh, hmm. since then but yeah uh, another one another one which came in overnight which came out with the trading update is data center operator um iomart i don't know if you know anything about uh this one i think it has about 12 data centers in the uk has gone through a bit of a sh- pretty poor performance really over the last few years in terms of top line but it should have secular tails tails um tailwinds behind it in terms of you know, the migration to the cloud and cybersecurity, but even more so now AI, et cetera. So it should, re- you know, recover. It's got a new management team. I don't know if you had, ever had a real good look at this one at all, uh, Roland. Yeah, it's, it is one I've started to, to have a look at recently. Like you say, it's really come down a bit. And uh, the problems, you know, the problems, I suppose, seem like they should be fixable. From what I understand, it has a bit of a, its customer base is, it has some niches where it's a bit stronger. I think law is one of them among its customers from memory. Uh, and as you say, new chief executive, it's, yeah, the the um, uh, the trading for last year, again, the margin margins still seem under pressure. I think they're having to spend a bit more and they've, uh, like everyone, they're trying to transition people onto subscription or recurring services. But um, they've seen, I think they've lost a load of some of their smaller customers maybe yeah. have, have pulled back. So margins are still under pressure, but overall it's always been quite a cash generative business i think and yeah. uh, as you say has the potential to 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 turn around nicely so it's something that's come on my radar uh recently really and uh i'm starting to have a look at it yeah yeah i thought it was also it's a bit like um speedy hire actually i mean it's better much better quality business but um yesterday it came out with a negative outlook and the and the brokers downgraded the expectation i think cavendish, cavendish have a a 240 price target now, which has been reduced from 260. Mm. But they cut the forecast for this year. So they're pretty much flat year on year in terms of PBT and, and EPS, I think. Yeah, but I shares- think I saw next year they reckon it's going to be fairly flat on yeah, EPS too, I think. Yeah, so yeah, it's... But so, it, so on that basis, resetting the barn quite a bit lower, i.e. not 15% higher EPS growth, which it was, the reaction was only one or two percent fall in the shares, and that that says to me actually that's that's quite encouraging. We it's it's either the market top level has started to sort of like take mm. these, the shares have got through to the bottom, and we should see better times ahead. Or alternatively, you know, people are thinking actually long term wise, but I mean these guys could get taken out, you know, by because it isn't actually easy to set up a new data center. You've got to get connectivity to the grid. And good luck with that if you're a new build facility. Mm. And also, you know, there's, there's, there's increasing regulation government-wise to hold per consumer data nationally. So if you can't get a facility, um, you know, and you can't, you can't connect your new facility, then you, you've got to hold your data locally, then actually incumbents like, you know, IMR could do quite well. Yeah, I mean, although it looks like a small business compared to the big, big names in the cloud it's been around quite a long time and uh, it, it is yeah it is established uh, among its customer base i think so yeah maybe maybe like you say you're seeing shares on bad news that aren't really falling it is um i tend to think of that as quite a positive sign really yeah when, no, so uh, do I. you know it's uh, either either the bad news is in the price or um or people are becoming more optimistic <laughs> yeah 
No, I think I it's a bit of both, but yeah. Okay, good. Well, let's go to one of the um, perhaps one of the spicier shares you talked about, which is S and U, which I think is a motor finance um, uh, funder or you know lender, and also does bridging finance for, for sort of properties and stuff. It does seem to have avoided the worst of the FCA investigation in terms of the mis-selling like PCPs of motor finance, a historical legacy. Can you give us your give us your thoughts on this one because um, it's a bit of a battleground st- stock, I think. Yeah, it's um, it's like I mean, it's a it's a family owned, family controlled business, and it's been a, I suppose you'd say, quite a, a good performer for a long time. But the FCA, I mean, at the start of this year, I'd have, I was looking at financials and thinking, you know, wow, there's a lot of value. There's quite a lot of financial stocks I'd potentially be quite mm. happy to own, but. The FCA, uh, you start to see that the FCA is quite a common factor across a lot of these businesses, and some of them are now looking harder to evaluate maybe at the moment. Yeah. And I know I, I mentioned Close Brothers, which I did own, but but don't, and that was, that's been hit badly. And uh, uh, as you say, S and U has been have been affected slightly differently. They've never done these discretionary commission arrangements on motor finance, so they're not exposed to that. That's what they say. But they do seem to be, um, the FCA does seem to have taken an interest in the way that they collect payments from borrowers mm. who fall behind because it's a non-prime offering. And so there's a new, another thing with the FCA in addition to consumer duty is, uh, I think it's called borrowers in financial difficulty. Mm. And from what I understand, reading the latest update, the, the results the other day, they are possibly having to show a bit more forbearance and, and maybe be uh, a little bit. Uh, maybe not have quite so much freedom to to charge to pursue late payments or to maybe charge penalties. I don't really know exactly, but their collection rate has dropped has dropped in the last quarter or so, and um, their estimate their provisions for bad debt have increased. And it's another one of those things where they're they're working with the FCA. They've got a, a skilled person in there looking at things, and they've changed some of their procedures. They say and. It's hard to see really where it's all going to pan out. This could be, I suppose, it could be a cheap business at the moment, but mm. they feel, looking at it this way, they feel strongly enough about the risks that they've cut the dividend, which is very unusual uh, historically for this business. So it's, uh, yeah, it could, I think it's, the question for me, I suppose, is is, is the motor finance generally going to be structurally a little bit less profitable maybe than it has been at the out, as an outcome of all of this that's going on across the sector. But uh, that is one attraction of the br- bridging finance business, though. It's not regulated at the moment, apparently. So uh, at the moment, anyway, it mm-hmm. seems to be growing nicely and uh, it's not quite so profitable, but it's expanding well. And it seems to be, uh, yeah, it seems to be a nice addition mm-hmm. to s and Yeah, I think it traded about net tangible book, doesn't it? Perhaps Mm. just slightly less. And I guess then what it, I mean, to me, what it would then come down to is what return on equity can it generate? And if it can generate sort of 12% plus, then it should be over, you know, more than one times, et cetera. I mean, where do you, where do you reckon? Because it, didn't it do sort of mid-teens when it was a sort of steady state business? Yeah, I think that generally in, in, in recent years, that's been about, that's been about right and so as historically buying it uh, buying it a book value i think has worked out quite well and, and it, perhaps it will do again this time you know you go it's a i think it's been around 80 years or something like that mm. you know so the inevitably going to get some ups and downs during that time but management have always been quite focused on the long term and they always appear previously to have had quite a good relationship with the regulators so you know it may well be that this is an opportunity but uh, it's becoming a little bit hard to to gauge what the impact of these rule changes and investigations is really going to be, isn't it? I think. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you got another question here, uh, Roland. Any thoughts on Kemring, which I think is the cyber security stroke uh, mainly defence company? It's a defence thing, I think, isn't it? it? Yeah, yeah. It, it's but it's got two arms. I think it's got the the flares business for helicopters as decoys. And then it's got a big business called Rogue, which does cyber security, cyber warfare, I think, which generates, it's growing very mm. rapidly in general. It's sort of hidden there, but it's it's significant profit. Do you want to give us your latest thoughts on this one? Uh, yeah, I think it's um, another one of these, yeah, another, sorry, another one of these thing, businesses that did actually, has had a, some ups and downs, but it seems to be doing really well. Yeah, look uh, at the at shares, the wow. That's what you, mean. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, it's not, 
massively profitable when you look at the at least when you look at the reported metrics the kind of uh, return on equity is averages has averaged around 10 percent in recent years it's and uh you know the the, the margins are about 10 percent as well so it's not massively profitable but it seems to have a lot of momentum behind it at the moment mm. and given the general broader outlook i suppose for defense spending these a lot of you know a lot of businesses in this sector seem to be to be recording strong order reporting strong order books uh and so on i've not looked at kemring in detail for a while mm. uh but yeah whether the price is up with events that's from from a value perspective i suppose i'd probably be looking to pay slightly less or to get a slightly higher yield but <laughs> uh you know there's no telling really it's it's it it doesn't seem to uh, ring any alarm bells at the moment uh, for me, I don't think. I love you, uh, Rowling. You're a man <laughs> for my own heart. I wouldn't pay too much for this, you know. It's sort of like no. a, you're more of a value sort of like guy, a bit like me, you know, sort of like look nickel and dime in occasionally. But I would say I mean, one thing there in terms of the actual charts, having gone up a lot, obviously they've had a, <clears throat> you know, they've had the extra sort of like, you know, boost perhaps from the um, the war between, you know, is in Gaza, the Israelis and stuff and what could happen in the Middle East and all this and the ongoing conflict in uh um, in, in Ukraine. But that does say to me, to a certain extent, either they're going to split the rope business off, they're going to do a you know an unbundling to release shareholder value because the rope business on its own is significantly, you know, or, or somebody's going to buy that rope business or alternatively, somebody's going to do it, it's going to take a number because it is a very consolidating sector. So that says to me, there's it because you're right, that, that's a pretty big jump, nearly a pound, et cetera. Uh, it's probably trading at high teens PE, which for historically is quite high. But I think people are th- assuming actually there's something strategic going to go on here, which is going to release um, mm, release that's value. Fair I, enough, yeah, yeah, totally, uh, totally, totally skeptical. So, totally don't know, but um, mm, let's wait and see. Now definitely. there is another there is there is another question in the automotive sector, which goes to uh, to uh, TI, which is uh, any thoughts on Dowlay? And I, I won't answer that one because. I'll ask the last the guy. It's Ben Sharman to uh, to refer to the one. I, I just we we chatted about it last week with um, with Cotney Rebel. So um, I'm sure he can have a look at that. We covered it in pretty much um, pretty much detail. What I'd like to do now is jump to TP ICAP, which is just a monster cash generator and dividend play. And this must fall into your oh, I like a nice cheap stop because I don't think you could optically get. <laughs> Anything cheaper than this, it trades at about seven and all, seven point three times PE, but pays a seven percent dividend yield, and is actually a bit of an unbundling play because management have indicated they're going to think about separating their data, their OTC data business, Parameter, aren't they? Do you want to take us through your latest thoughts on this one? Yeah, it's. I mean, it's one of those businesses. It really is a bit of a black box if you don't work in the in the in the city. I think in terms mm. of what it does with its. Uh, uh, you know, being an interdealer broker, they call it, don't they? So they deal yeah, in it. wholesale trades and all things like foreign exchange, interest rates, energy. And uh, it's obviously suffered from the growth of electronic markets. And so over the years, a number of acquisitions have been made to try and bulk up the the things like areas, you know, expertise in areas like data and energy. And uh, it's, it's, its performance has been a bit inconsistent, I suppose, over the years. But again, it's one of those businesses that seems to be doing doing better now and as you say there's the case of question of whether there's the value in there from from parameter uh which i think has been some people are valuing at that at kind of upwards of a billion pounds Easy, yeah. yeah and uh, when you've got the market cap for the whole group at 1.7 billion and uh it you can see you can see there might be an opportunity it's 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 kind of been a disappointer over the years but more recently it looks like there's there's got to be some value in there somewhere. The sector's consolidated, and I think, from what I understand, they're one of the bigger players in this in this sector uh, for the core broking business. So it, it looks to me like there's limited downside, and there's there's some opportunity to either release value, but also to deliver growth within the business as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, one thing that strikes me about the data business, though, the idea of selling it, is that I think I guess a lot of its data that they use. Um, comes from the company's own history of transactions that stretches back, you know, 20 years or whatever. So you, to me, it's one of those things you wonder if it's more valuable within the company. But I can see there's there's obviously a lot of pressure on management to to generate, to release some value on this or to to prove, you know, to prove the valuation. It's on seven times earnings and mm. 7% yield. So 
Well, yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, that parameter is a goal, is, is, is basically a crown jewel in that business. I mean, the, mm. I think it generates about 100 million of EBIT. It does 50, 60 percent EBIT margins, about 100 million, I think, of, of EBIT. And the, it's growing at organically high single digits, maybe low double digit, et cetera. And if you release it outside of um, of TPI cap, it then can sell those services to all interdealer brokers and to you know other TP competitors who don't take it because they don't want that because they want to go with somebody else. So you mm. get that you know vertical. You separate the vertical integration and you 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 bring that out. And I would say it doesn't just compete against lots of you know BGC partners and people like that. It actually competes against the prime brokers as well. I know it acts as a, a as a player to help them, but it also the Goldman Sachs and these kind of guys. And therefore, separating that business and these type of businesses with those type of margins, with recurring revenue ninety percent plus recurring revenue streams, that fifteen times EBIT easy. And um, I mean, that, that's how you get one point five billion, you know, pounds. But um, hey, the, the, the thing I would say is, if they did that and they did try to sell it, then they'd probably have some capital gain. So it's got to be done tax efficiently. I think they'd more do it as a spin out rather than actually as a sale. So you'd give investors new shares in those and they can then manage their own, you know, sort of capital gains efficiently as they do. The big the big question, I guess, is is what, you know, the, the balance sheet, and as you rightly say, is a bit of a, a black box. I think they've got net cash on their balance sheet of 130, but they need about a nearly a billion of regulated capital so they haven't so so they have to have that as to cover their mm. their positions and that's the difficult bit is if they had something go horribly wrong <laughs> yeah i mean for- you do see that with some of these businesses you think they they need the cash it's like uh another one but some of the others we've talked about i think like uh like ig index when you look at them yeah. they appear to have stacks of cash but they need it for marge to be able to post margin and, yeah. and all the rest of it don't they and to to keep the regulator so it's not surplus yeah. um by any stretch i don't think no. okay well let's in fact let's move to um ig index um given um it's a, it's a stock i think you've owned for some time isn't it and again yeah, it's a, right. a real sort of like massive dividend pay a huge margins number one in its industry in cdfs and spread betting and all kinds of stuff um the shares actually have been a bit soft compared to CMC Markets, which has gone through the roof. Actually, <laughs> yeah, I think although CMC Markets did did probably fall further before it started yeah, to rise true. again, but uh, yeah, it's um yeah, it's been through a bit of an uncertain period. I think there's been some uh, change in the kind of change in chief executive and. Mm. Uh, and softening is much softer trading as the markets, you know, as as markets have cooled off after the pandemic or from 22 to 22 onwards, there's been just less trading activity among its core client base. And that always drops through quite quickly to to uh, to a slower performance. But that's that's business as usual for them. And I think their efforts to expand uh are gradually starting to bear fruit. I think they they've got a uh, an options trading business for the retail for retail investors in the U.S., which is a big market in the U.S. I think it's it's strange because it's not really something that's generally accessible to UK retail investors, is it? But mm. it's uh, it is big in the U.S. and I think that's about twenty percent of group revenue now. From what I understand, it's a bit lower margin, but it does have growth potential. And there's some other stuff that they're developing that's more for institutional customers. But I think the big news here at the moment is, well, two things. When market activity improves, I guess I would expect their trading yeah. activity of their core customers to improve. They say that balances have remained fairly, account balances have remained fairly stable. So people aren't pulling out all their money. Um, but the other thing is they've got a new chief executive who seems to be keen uh, to really, to, to seems to be making a clean sweep. The chief, the, 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 the chief financial officer and a very long serving uh, chief operating officer both announced their departure since he started work so oh, wow. he seems to be making a clean sweep of the of the boardroom and he he was the guy uh, he used to be chief executive of paddy power betfair and i think since then he's been running a payments business and historically he started out as a derivatives trader so he's he's a uh, he's no. straddled the gaming and or the you know straddled gaming and financial services and and uh, that's that is kind of the nature of IG's business in some ways, isn't it? The elements of both. So he yeah. he seems to have a reputation as as someone who's not afraid to uh, to get things done and make decisions. So it'll be interesting to see what he says about the strategy uh, having having in, that he's inherited. 
Yeah. Um, but yeah, as you say, it's market leader. It doesn't look expensive to me, very cash generative and a long track record of of decent dividends. So I've held it for quite a few years. Mm. Yeah, I would. And also I'd say as it keeps moving more towards sort of straight through processing of the um, the CDFs and, um, you know, the spread bets, et cetera, then uh, it should get a, it should get a re-rating because I know these the, the regulated risk is always going to sort of like a, put a bit of a sort of like a, a, a compressor mm. on the actual multiple, but trading it sort of like, you know, what is it? Uh, eight times. Yeah, eight PE times, does, yeah. Yeah, eight and a half times PE does look a bit... Um, a bit cheap to say the least yeah. okay well, there's one question which came in overnight it came to do with really for me i suppose it's really a vector which is a um it's a company that's de developing and um uh, a new sort of like uh, cancer uh, treatment um for um basically to it just gone through phase one clinical trials it did a big presentation out in san diego to the american uh, cancer uh, body let me put the um the chart on it um up and um, there was a presentation done not only to experts across the industry, but also to investors. And uh, the, the the question really from investors was just what my my thoughts on it. And and really, I think the the key takeaways from the presentation and from the new data which was released is that the you know the AVA six thousand chemo warhead um, uh, development product is is doing what it says it's doing. It's releasing the doxorubicin into the the tumor. Um, and the safety profile is excellent. And I think one of the key takeaways that I saw from the presentation was there was a, a hundred times more chemotherapy released on the cancerous tumor than there was in the blood. So the safety profile is, is, is working. The efficacy was indicated that it is working as well because you've got instances where you had um, high FAP um, activated uh, tumors. Um, there, there was, there were, that seemed to be um, shrinking. And the next key stage, and this really comes to, you know, to my, you know, if I, you know, if I, I'm not an investor, but if I was an investor, is the development and to get the optimum level of dosage for the for um, the prodoxorubis and the AVA six thousand, the level of frequency that you can dose it, and i.e. two weeks or three weeks, but also then the number of cycles that you can do it, and that will come over the next six months to then go into the phase two pivotal trials, and that's the expertise that really is you know you you got to rely on on a vector to be able to overlay that one. So uh, let me try to put the chart up on that one. But the, the shares trade, well, basically 52p, 53p, which I think is around about a market cap of 190 million. Um, but frankly, if they can get this right and bring it to market, then, you know, we can talk many multiples more than that. But um, the key the key is, is that the data is very, very good for phase one trials, but it is only a sample population of 42 patients. And on that basis, it's still fairly early days. Um, but um, as I say, it was it was good to speak, good to see the... Um, the CEO who um, who did the presentation. Okay, right. Well, let's um, let's move out to um, another stock that you own, which is um, let's go for supermarket um, income REIT, which is a slightly um, safer play, isn't it? This one. Let me um, put the chart up, which I think does basically it finances property, doesn't it? For um, um, for supermarket for basically supermarkets and puts it on this and, and acts as the landlord across the UK. The shares have really got hit, haven't they? And I guess that's a sort of like you know synonymous with interest rates going up because it's a dividend play REIT, and then these mm. guys get hit as a, as a anything which is quasi bond like gets hit by interest rates. Yeah, I mean, as you say, I think they have about fifty five supermarkets, and they they lease them back to the big to the big supermarkets and yeah. uh, I think 77% of rent comes from Sainsbury's and Tesco. So there's no real credit risk from the tenants. Although I suppose you might say the tenants are quite uh, are in quite a strong negotiating position yeah. perhaps as well. But yeah, this was one of these REITs. I mean, there've been a lot of them float over the last sort of five to 10 years, haven't there? And this mm. was floated in 2017 and it often traded above NAV really uh, until interest rates started to rise. And so, so I wasn't really I'm not something I've been interested in in the past because uh, it didn't look it didn't look all that cheap. But uh, and the yield, you know, the yield was quite compressed, Ben. But now you can see it. The yield is something like eight uh, percent, and it's yeah. at a at a at a reasonable discount to NAV. Um, from what I can see, looking at the latest results, the uh, the dividend still seems to be just about covered. Um, their debt. Costs are still quite low. 
they're mostly hedged um and you know it, uh, don't see uh, leverage the kind of loan to value ratio is was about 33 percent, i think so mm-hmm. it doesn't seem over leveraged and uh, long leases to the supermarkets no real credit risk i think the only thing to watch for is is refinancing because a a lot of their debt is uh it's got shorter maturity than their leases so potentially I suppose you know debt costs could still have a bit further to rise as their hedges roll off and they have to and they have to renew facilities. So I don't I don't have any specific insight into that happening, but it seems to me a risk. But in the meantime, yeah, I think it looks like quite a safe play for income. Really, I wouldn't expect too much capital gain, you know, too much growth from it. But uh, an eight percent yield. Um, yeah, it seems like an interest rate play to me. Mm. I mean, you know, if you. If if you think about the valuation of their in the line, you know, properties, it comes down to what you can finance it for, doesn't it? And if interest rates come down, you can finance it for less. The valuation of the property and the rental income go up. And uh, if you believe, yeah. if if you believe that the UK is is going to, you know, cut it, have a have a neutral level of interest rates. Let's say for argument, two and a half, three percent longer term, because you can't afford it otherwise. Then uh, that's half of where it currently is. So. You should get a, a good bounce. You might, you might not only do you get your income, but if whilst you wait for interest rates to come down, you probably then when it does come down, you'll see a, 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 some capital appreciation. Yeah, I mean, certainly like a lot of these. I mean, there's a lot of these these uh, REITs and also some of the energy investment trusts that mm. are in the same situation. You're really balancing off the cost of funding, the income they receive, which may be inflation linked. I think quite a lot of supermarket income. Uh, quite a lot of their rent is inflation linked, but you're balancing off these things, aren't you? The interest rates, the property costs, the property value, the income, and the financing cost. And and if you if they get it right, there's a nice dividend stream yeah. to come out of that. And uh, but sometimes it can get squeezed if if things don't go exactly as you hope. And uh, yeah, you certainly if interest rates come down as much as you're as you're saying, I'm not sure. I, I don't know if they will. I'm I'm looking at interest rates more or less on the basis that they're not going to come down as soon as people think, um, because I suppose that's just how my mind works. Really, that mm. I think I think there's you know they took a lot longer to go up than anyone ever expected, and I think they might stay at this level for a little bit longer before coming down. They're not you know interest rates five percent isn't high on a historical in a historical context. Um, and already expectations for rate cuts seem to be getting pushed back from what you see in the, you know, uh, bank commentary. Mm. But uh, yeah, if certainly if rates come down, then I guess this would move back towards NAV again. And uh, it could deliver a nice total return if that happens. Mm. Yeah, all I would say is that governments around that the problem with democracy, and we love democracy, <laughs> it's the best system, don't get me wrong, and capitalism, it's the best system, no doubt about it. But the problem is you have to get votes voted in every four or five years. And as we've seen the movie already play in in um, in Japan, in the 80s, etc., it built up a huge you know property boom and stock market boom with a, on, on the back of a shed load of debt. And it's and that's why it's had negative interest rates for forty years, and it's only now starting to get slightly above that because it cannot afford to finance the the payments. The government can't. Unfortunately, the UK is now over one hundred percent GDP, you know, debt net debt to GDP. The US is over, even more so, and therefore you get into this stage where anything more than five percent long term, the governments can't afford to do it because they'd have to go through some severe austerity measures, which would get them kicked out. And therefore, it's not democracy um, sort of supportive in terms of getting, you know, mm. bonds. so, I mean, I could see us going half a bit Japanesey type of stuff. You're going to get deflation a bit from China. But anyway, that's, it's all macro, isn't it? We'll yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, yeah, there is, there's other ways of looking at it. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Okay, um, we've got a, a, a follow-up question from Sarkoza just on, um, on TI fluid systems uh, for you, Roland. It says, his question is, it looks a bit of a low margin business and it generates, I think there's about sort of 7% EBIT margins, which to me actually looks about right for automotive actually, but you know. Yeah, it, it, that is, that would, I suppose that would be one of my concerns. And on, on the back of that too, it's fair to say that the, the, the part of the business that makes the fuel systems is higher margin than the other part of the business, which makes a broader range of fluid control products and so mm. you've got arguably a legacy product is the higher margin part of the business and so there is that there is that risk and uh, I, I 
be probably wanting to, you know, hoping to see margins improve a bit as as the business continues to to make progress. But yeah, it's a fair point. Yeah. Uh, I think operating margin last year was less than six percent, so it isn't um, isn't terrific in that sense. You'd like to see a bit more pricing power, I yeah. suppose. Okay, well, let's switch gears to um, another stock that uh, reported this week. is a bit smaller. It's called Venture Life, and that it does have OTC healthcare uh, products, so things like. Um, intimate women's health and energy um, uh, products and stuff like this. And uh, the shares have been totally battered over the last few years. But again, I mean, it trade it doesn't pay a dividend, actually. So sorry about that, Roland. <laughs> it, it trades on about seven times PE, just above, um, and um, which is essentially sort of like about a third of what um, Hallion uh, trades at, uh, which is obviously a much bigger competitor. And what you get is what as you go through scale, then you get higher multiples and better margins. But this is actually going through a margin increasing story. Um, EBITDA margins ticked up 2% from 20% to 22% last year. It generated class, reduced its debt um, to around about 1.3 times at the year end and it's now going to 1.1 times uh, leverage and, they're, and importantly they're growing and they had organic growth of about five percent mainly on volume so the underlying business is, is doing well it's generating improving gross margin sorry improving um ebit margins and um you know, greater cash what the um get what the the broker did this you know um this this week is just trim down the expectations for this year because they're investing more in marketing and product development and innovation which is actually a bit like one of a similar company called alliance um pharma and um uh, you know it tra- it, who knows where you know what will happen because the markets are crazy but it it looks like a, to me it looks like a good niche product with lots of repeat you know brand um uh you know consumers who keep returning to the brands mm. or brand loyalty um looks, looks looks wrong price to me but i don't know if you ever had a look at this one at all um uh Rowland. yeah i've had a i've had a i've had a I looked at it um occasionally and it like you say it's it doesn't seem to low. I think um, it doesn't seem to have very high margins again, actually. And uh, and I wonder if, from what I understand, quite a lot of its output is actually private label products for other customers. So it's not all its own branded. That's correct. Uh, stuff. Yeah. So I wonder whether that's maybe one reason why there, there could always be a bit of margin pressure. But as you say, the top line growth does seem to have been really good. I think is about twenty percent a year compounded mm. over the last five years, and an operating profit has actually improved on a, on a similar rate so yeah it could be cheap for me i'm i'm not uh i wonder what the quality of the, some of the brands is they're they're yeah. kind of i think they're they're probably not quite at the same level as as like um some of the the former gsk consumer yeah. healthcare brands and that sort of thing but it's one of those businesses that if it can deliver and uh and, and you know keep following the process successfully it could mm. be could be worth a bit more i can see i can see see both sides i suppose on this um yeah. they have, they, i think the house broker singers have got a uh 68 or was it cavendish that cavendish have got a 68p price target on it and um, mm. again it's not not based on stretch valuations at all so uh in fact i would be i would not be surprised to be perfectly honest if one of the um private equity houses but puts a number on these and buys them out because as you say there's a roll-up strategy because to trade on what seven times pe if if it was double the size or triple the size, you'd get a twelve times PE. So they could they could, you know, improve the margins, do a lot of lot more self help maybe off the market, and you know, g- cheaply fund it, and then roll it into another business OTC, perhaps even Alliance mm. Pharma. Yeah, and, it reminds uh, me a bit of Alliance Pharma. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and on that basis, you know, move two businesses on seven times PE up to twelve or thirteen times PE. Sally, you've made a good turn over two to three years. I should, mm. I should, I should, I should give, I should give Carlisle a ring, <laughs> shouldn't I, or something like that? <laughs> one of the guys. Okay, well, let's let's switch gears to um, another one. I know you quite like Ocean Wilsons, which is a real hybrid business. It's sort of like a investment house in terms of lots of portfolio investments, but has also got a big business which does sort of like um, marine uh, services, towing boats and stuff like that out in Brazil. I mean, yeah, what's... so port facilities in Brazil and all sorts. Yeah, it is really odd because it has these two unrelated yeah. things. Um, the, I mean, the infrastructure side of it 
is something that would probably be quite a nice business on its own for all for you uh, know, it's, okay. I would say. Um, and funnily enough, there's one of the things that's caused the shares to really pick up um, in recent recent months is that the company has has said they're looking at the idea of strategic review and the idea of separating off that all that um, port related uh, maritime infrastructure business into a into some kind of uh, separate vehicle because they don't own it outright they think they own a majority stake 50 something percent mm. in the wilson sons business which is the, the stuff in brazil the the investment stuff is it's like a kind of fund of funds there's loads of hedge funds and all sorts of stuff in there following some kind of complex strategy and it must pay a lot in fees i guess uh indirectly but um it's it's I think some people, I think I've read that if they just put it in an S&P 500 tracker over the last five or 10 years, they might have done, they might have got a better investment return. But yeah, it's one of those things. It's ultimately, I think, more or less a family controlled business or controlled by a dominant shareholder by a quite a complex indirect structure. Um, but it's often traded at a discount to book value. Um, it's got a good record of income and it's still, I think the last reported NAV was 18 pounds a share at the end of last year. Yeah, that's right. So it's, it's still well below book value and arguably perhaps there's, you know, and, and arguably cheap because if they can find a way of realizing some value from that, that, uh, the port infrastructure stuff that could be worth it could attract a reasonable valuation because of course you can't you can't really compete with a business like that or duplicate it very easily mm. can you it's it's uh once it's there it's it tends to be the if it's in the right place and it works well then it, it's something that has a lasting value and and uh, uh and attracts a lot of 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 uh permanent capital these days then yeah yeah absolutely right mm. i mean you know that private credit the amount of investing is just phenomenal going to the infrastructure but particularly you've had big transactions in infrastructure by brookfield and also just recently i think blackstone did the same sort of thing and um, it's a real hotbed of sort of like you know venture capital not venture capital private equity mm. type investments simply because it has long returns stickable returns where those those fund managers can earn guaranteed fees over 20 30 years through managing that portfolio so yeah I'll, I'll, that that is really interesting actually and it would not surprise me actually you know coming back to the other one you mentioned which in a similar is supermarket income REIT you know they've had a lot of consolidation there and that's why there's a lot of you know sort of like M&As because people see if you're a if you're a fund manager owning those assets or you know, very strongly tied into it, then you can earn good fees for a long time with huge visibility, which gives you that differentiation against these the traditional open ended fund model. Mm, I mean, it's probably worth saying that it's been a it's been a bit of a value situation for a long time, and there's no guarantee that that won't remain the case because of the the, the ownership structure. I don't think they're too. I don't think they you know they're not too vulnerable to external pressure from yeah. other minority shareholders but it does seem to be an interesting situation and it's and the management have said they're looking at uh at possibilities so in the meantime it, there's a there's a nice income and i'm i'm happy to hold on for a while and see see what happens yeah okay good i just want to wrap up another question that i had last night um just before it's um, a company called lung life and the reason why is I interviewed their CEO uh, earlier in the week. And this this company does um, diagnostics for early stage lung cancer using um, uh, circulating tumor uh, cells as the um, as the biomark. And it, it basically came out with validation study results about 80 percent. It was 80 percent positive predictive value, which is industry leading compared to the standard of care at 60 percent. So significant um, uplift. I would encourage people to have a look at that video because there was some really interesting stuff that uh, the CEO, Paul Bogano, um, said to me. First of all, they're doing strategic options to accelerate the commercialization of their, their diagnostics platform, which uses both, the, say, the, the CTC, but also uses AI um, to improve it. There's two really interesting things. The strategic options, which could involve sort of partnering, licensing, but also M&A, and this would perfectly fit into a big diagnostic, cancer diagnostics firm, I don't know, somebody like 
Hologic or Roche or um, you know um, Exact Sciences, somebody like that, and there's a bit drop in the ocean, sort of ten million market cap. And then the other really interesting bit, he, he it was fantastic. He talked about the biobank that they have data there, which is unique in the industry in terms of gathering data just for early stage cancer because it it basically gets the blood samples, the plasma samples and the CT scans, and, and, and you can leverage all of that data to improve the, um, in the, the performance of your product, but also be strategic to other potential acquirers as well in this potential space as well to help them. As them. So I would encourage people to have a look at that. The, the price of the shares currently are at, what, 32p. Investec did an updated note after their recent prelims. They've, got, they've still got a, they've got a price target of £2.20. So if they can get this one up and operational is significant. The, th the problem with healthcare investing for a lot of people is they can't see the revenues and therefore they feel as though they can't value it. But the, the, the big thing comes down to is how much that IPR is worth. And then it becomes, you know, just uh, it's, it's, it's really sticking with it if you believe that the, the value of the underlying IPR is, um, is a lot more than the current share price. And um, anyway, this, this, Clearly, Investec and um, I mean, I tend to agree that the you know there's, there's too many battered shares, but it is it isn't without risk. It's quite uh, you know it's only a sort of ten million um, uh, market cap. Anyway, and, um, just to tell it, if anybody wants to um, ask any more questions, then please pop them in. Um, I don't think there's um, any more actually, um, Roland. So um, I have to say big thanks again. Very generous of you to give up your time uh, to talk about stocks. We've had a really good blast. Uh, through and uh, just well, let's just end actually just on your view of the markets for the rest of the year so you're reasonably optimistic uh yeah i think i think there's plenty of opportunities out there in uk stocks um you know no no great insight on in what's going to happen over the next six months but i think for anyone who's looking for looking for value and quality at a reasonable price there are there are plenty of opportunities to 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 buy stuff that you can hold on to and, and do okay for a while. Uh, and that's that's really my plan, hopefully. Brilliant. Okay, well, thanks again, um, Roland. Oh, and um, thanks look for forward in me. looking forward to touching base in a, in a couple of months' time. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye.